In Liwa, however, no one exhausts their camels at racetracks. At Mrs. Al-Mansouri's place, they even enjoy a well-earned retirement. For younger generations, these big, cuddly, one-and-a-half-ton animals are a reminder of a life they have never known. But Mrs. Al-Mansouri has experienced the transformation of Bedouin society and the oasis firsthand. I was born into a rural family. My father and my grandfather before him started growing dates. I take care of the plantation now for my own enjoyment. I like the idea of being independent, of being able to come here with my children. I do as I please here. It's important for me to keep this place and share it with my children. On the family's land, Mrs. Al-Mansouri looks after her palm grove the traditional way. As males and females grow on two different trees, she transfers the pollen by hand to get the best possible fruit in a few months' time. I grow all sorts of dates. Kala, Lulu, Goman, Daba, Gnazi, Ziz, there are sati, too, which originated in Saudi Arabia. I also grow tomatoes, bell peppers, eggplant, cilantro, parsley, dill, cabbage, and cauliflower. All the vegetables you find at the market, I grow here. When she planted her first vegetables in the 1970s, Mrs. Al-Mansouri was among the pioneers. One by one, she and all those who resisted the lure of the big city created the vast plantations we see today. But how could Liwa Oasis, a transit point, suddenly support such a concentration of trees and agriculture? Where did they find the water needed to create this crescent of greenery in the middle of the desert? On the surface, the Rubal Kali is an erg, a desert of fine sand with no permanent watercourses. The area receives just 40 millimetres of rainfall per year, and to develop it, the water beneath its dunes had to be harnessed. Buried for millennia, this natural underground water reservoir is what specialists call an aquifer. About 30,000 years ago, the climate of the Arabian Peninsula was much wetter than it is today. Rainwater seeped through the soft subsoil until it reached the bedrock, the hard, solid area of rock at a depth of 100 meters. It stagnated and absorbed mineral salts. Each successive rainfall deposited a new, younger and fresher lens of water above it. This is the water that the Bedouin managed to draw for their herds, and most importantly, it is this water that modern techniques brought to the surface at the height of the oil boom. One man led, almost single-handedly, the greatest development the area has known in its thousands of years of history. This man was Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan El Nayan, the father of the Emirati nation and the founder of the modern state. Throughout the country, schemes like this are underway. Propagated in nurseries, the young trees are then transplanted to the desert. As they grow, they bring back life to what was once no more than barren sand. 
Following independence in 1971, Liwa became the epicenter of a Green New Deal. This resulted in the creation of the larger states, which ushered in a new era of prosperity for the Emirates, and in which their owners still take pride today. The late Sheikh Zayed realized that if you have agriculture, you have civilization. He understood that with agriculture, we could be stronger and more self-reliant. The opportunity to be able to grow your own food meant that you were able to command your own destiny. And he took it one step further and started to be able to bring fresh water to the agricultural practices in the region. And with that, in what was considered a very arid and very hostile territory, you began to see a flourishing of agricultural practice to green the desert because understanding of access to water, the understanding of how to manage our environment and work with the environment to be able to grow crops became possible. Water for all. The country's rarest and most precious resource suddenly began to flow. Thanks to oil money, wells, channels and irrigation networks sprang up everywhere, even in the heart of the desert. Creating a few somewhat surreal situations in the process. For this is not a lake. Although it looks completely natural, it is actually artificial. The result, in fact, of substantial leakage, it now attracts birds from all over the world. Ornithologist Shahid Bashir Khan has even come from Indian Kashmir to study this extravagance. It has huge numbers of uh, common pochards, mallards, grey herons, uh, great cormorants, flamingos. It's not just an assemblage of species, it's the whole system. So you'll also see smaller birds, you will see raptors, birds that hunt on them. And it's very interesting if you see 80% of the bird species that have been recorded in UAE are migratory. So it's a large chunk of species that are moving once to south and again around this time of the year to the north. In the past, a few Bedouin traveled across the desert on camels. Today, 90% of the Emirates population comes from abroad, and other travelers who wing their way around the world stop off here as well. When we look at the migratory pathways around the globe, UAE is in the West Asian, East African pathway. And most of these birds, which includes a lot of water birds that uh, you will usually see along our shores, the coastline. So they go through the land because all of these green areas, they will have insects. So the smaller birds, they will stop here. They will tend to eat those insects, refuel. These are their refueling stations. They will stay for some time and then they will move south. And what is also important is some of the water birds, they breed around that inland wetland. 